Hello, everybody, and welcome to another wonderful day of chemistry. So today we're going to be focusing a lot on essentially the accuracy and precision of our numbers. So one of the big things that we're going to be dealing with is we're going to be playing around with a lot of numbers this semester. And a good thing when you're dealing with numbers is to make sure you're very clear on how well you know a given number. And this is the reason why statistic uh, significant figures tend to come into play. So one of the first things that we should always keep in mind is whenever we're dealing with any quantitative measurement, our numerical values don't really mean anything unless we know how much I can rely on these numbers. And we tend to rely, uh, talk about the reliability of numbers in two, uh, two slightly different metrics. Uh, the first of which is accuracy. Now, one of the things to watch out for accuracy is it's often colloquially used a little bit differently than its scientific definition. So accuracy is entirely based on how well the experimental value agrees with whatever the quote unquote true value is, the actual number. And one of the important things to keep in mind is that mm, instrumentation is never quite perfect techniques are always vulnerable to error. So what you measure may not be what the system is truly at. Uh, the other one is precision. And this comes into play when we're making multiple measurements. And this is based on how well the values agree with each other. And part of the problem is if we don't know what the true value is, we often have only are given information about precision. And these two don't always have to be related. Just because a value is precise doesn't mean that it's accurate. And a good way to think about this is in the uh, is in the old analogy of a dartboard. If you're throwing darts, you could be accurate and precise. Everybody ends up in the bullseye. It's a nice close grouping. However, it's equally likely to be very precise, but not accurate. You throw nice tight clusters of darts it only happens that they're sitting in the one, uh, the one point region. So it doesn't really, it isn't really helpful. And this actually does happen sometimes where all of your uh, measurements will agree with each other very well, but there's some sort of error that's pushing you off to the edge. Conversely, you could have data that doesn't agree well with each other, but if you take the average, you found the straight middle of the point. So it's fairly accurate but not exactly precise. And then of course you have something, uh, you can have measurements that aren't either. You're throwing wildly, you take the average, you're still off and they don't agree with each other. So it's possible to be both inaccurate and imprecise. So deviations from a true value or the, uh, the ideal value are often due to one major, uh, two major types of error. The first of which is systematic error. So these are gonna be errors that uh, lead to the measured value being consistently wrong. So the one I like thinking about with this is, uh, this is, tends to be often attributed to instruments. So you can have a ruler with a worn out base. You don't know what your zero mark is. So all your distances are going to be off by whatever that eroded distance is. But one of the things that I like to emphasize is a lot of people think about systematic error only being due to instruments, but it's often just as likely due to user error. So this is a common problem. I have a nice ruler like this. My zero line is here, but people tend to actually line up the beginning of their point based on the base of the ruler. Well, the, these are often different by say a couple millimeters. So all of your, everything you measure is off by a couple of millimeters, but everything is consistently wrong. And the nice part about systematic error is you know, if you know how consistently wrong you are, you can go ahead and fix the problem. So for example, if you know the, diff, uh, the distance going from the base to your zero mark, you can just subtract that from all your measurements and you do have a good value. So in this case, if you have error, we like it to be systematic error because once you know it's there, you can usually correct it. But here's the thing, you have to keep an eye out for it because um, um, 
you have to keep an eye out for this type of error uh, because that's the only way you can make a good measurement because you have to know it needs to be corrected. And this is actually, if you have just systematic error, this often leads to inaccurate but fairly precise measurements. So again, always keep an eye out for this type of error. And it's one of the reasons why we, why if you can, you should always compare to a known quantity when doing a technique for the first time to figure out if there's any systematic error, either with your instruments or with your technique. The other one's a little bit more insidious. So the other major type of error is random error. And this usually tends to give us uh, imper uh, imprecise measurements. And these are going to be errors that yield numbers that are both higher and lower than the true value. So you're always consistently off. So if you have good technique, so for example, again, taking a ruler, if you always make sure to line up the uh, bottom of your object to the zero mark, uh, you take accurate readings, you can usually minimize your random error. But again, it is worth noting that you're never going to be able to fully eliminate random error because for example, in this case, uh, the ruler only gives us uh, good measurements down to a tenth of an inch. Anything less than that, and I kind of have to guess what the value is. So I'm always going to have some amount of random error present. And, and also, if you have random error present, it's also going to be very hard to correct for it because you're never, sh because since the uh, errors tend to be high or low, you can't fix it by a single value like you can with systematic error. And it's this existence of random uh, fluctuating error that is one of the reasons why when we record numbers, it's very important to know how well I know the number that I recorded. So again, think to that ruler. I only truly know the number to a tenth of an inch. I may be able to estimate it to a hundredth of an inch because it may be closer to 0.1 or closer to 0.2, but that's kind of the best I can do. So when I'm recording a number, I'm going to write down every number, and then I'm often going to write down a last estimated digit. So again, in the ruler, we know uh, everything up to, say, the hundreds, and we do an estimated hundreds. So whenever I have a number reported, our significant figures are going to be all of the digits that are known, and a last one that is estimated. So in this case, we have five significant figures. We include that last estimated number. So we know four, we estimate the fifth. And in general, uh, the greater the precision in a measurement, the more significant figures we're going to tend to possess. However, one of the things we have to watch out for is there's often some cases where it's hard to tell whether a number is significant or not. So in general, <clears throat> we count start by counting significant figures by the first non-zero digit, and our last uh, and all of our non-zero digits and any zeros in between will always be significant. If you have zeros at the end, uh, this actually gets a little bit more nuanced. If they're to the right of a decimal point, these numbers will be significant. If they're to the left of a decimal point, so over here, it's a little harder to tell. And so one of the things that I like that I find very useful is if you record your number in scientific notation. So write, rewrite this number in scientific notation. It comes out as 4.004500 times 10 to the negative third. Any number in this prefactor will be significant. So for example, this number has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven significant figures, and then this exponent just tells us how much we have to shift to the right or left. And this, uh, uh, this exponential method will always really help show you the number of significant figures. So, however, it is uh, useful for some people if we work through the rules of significant figures in a little bit more detail. So again, looking at this number, all non-zero digits are, are significant and any interior zeros, so between two non-zero numbers are going to be significant. So these first 
five digits are for sure significant. So any trailer trailing zeros, so zeros at the end of the number that are after a decimal point are going to be significant. Any leading zeros uh, are not significant. So they are essentially just going to be telling us where the decimal point is. If you think about the exponential number, they're essentially embedded in that power of the, of the equation, that 10 to the negative third, telling me where it is with respect to zero. And again, trailing uh, zeros at the end of a number, but before a decimal point, tend to be fairly ambiguous. And we tend to try and avoid them. Uh, one of the tricks to avoid any ambiguity, so let's say I've got a number like 41,000. It's hard for me to tell where the last significant digit is. I know these first two numbers are significant for sure, but these two numbers, I'm not sure what, uh, whether any of these are significant. So what we can do is we can underline the last significant digit. In this case, it's the first zero. And that tells me that anything uh, that four, one, and zero are significant. So I've got three significant digits. If I had underline the second zero, or if I just left a decimal point, would imply I have a full four significant digits. However, if I had not included the underline or the decimal point, we would just assume that only the first two digits are significant. If there is any, isn't any information to indicate otherwise, we typically treat trailing zeros before a decimal point as insignificant. So this helps me identify the significant digits inside a given number. However, it is worth noting that we often are going to need the, to use these numbers to do mathematics. So what we're can, uh, so we have to figure out how significant digits change with various mathematical operations. So if I'm dealing with addition or subtraction, the significant figures are going to be determined by the location of the decimal point, or essentially the order of the number. So let's say I'm adding these two numbers, 1.021 and 2.9, add them together. Well, this first number is, all, is good to the thousandths or the third decimal point. The second number is good to the hundredths. So we take whichever, uh, whichever is the least significant number and that's our significance. So our ending product is only good to the hundredths place. So, uh, at the end of my math, uh, mathematics, I'll round this guy to 3.71. So that's my, uh, that's my number with correct sig figs. Multiplication and division are a little bit different. They're determined by the number of sig figs. So whatever the least number of sig figs of one of the contributing numbers is, that's going to be the number of sig figs for the product. So if I'm multiplying 4.34 and 9.2, 4.34 has three significant figures, 9.2 has two. So my product will have two. And in this case, I have to round my last number to the two significant figures. So I have, with correct sig figs, I have 40. Note that I included a decimal point. Here, this indicates that the zero should be significant. And we aren't going to be doing too much with exponents, but I want you to be aware that exponents also have their same have their own rules for significant figures. So if I've got an exponent and I perform uh, a power equation, um, my significant figures are dictated by the number of decimal point uh, the the numbers after the decimal point. So in this case, I've got two numbers after my decimal point. So the ending number should be good to two sig figs. Now this seems a little bit weird, but I'll show you why this works. So I can rewrite this number because of the rules of exponents as 10.81 times 10 to the fourth. Because when I have, I multiply two numbers with, of the same power, uh, with the same base by an exponent, what I can essentially do is add the exponents. So 10, point, 10 to the 0 0.81 times 10 to the fourth are the same as 10 to the 4.81. Now, when I do this, I can then apply my math to this first exponent. And this guy is 6.45 times 10 to the fourth. However, I've got two significant figures on this number. So I'll have two significant figures on the leading factor. So I've got 6.4 
times 10 to the fourth. So with correct sig figs, I have 64,000 uh, as the correct number. So one of the other, uh, there's a couple other extra rules we should keep in mind when playing with uh, significant figures. Uh, the first of which is whenever I'm dealing with an integer number, they have infinite sig figs. Now this begs the question of what is an integer number? This is going to be a number that only works in integer qualities. It has to be a whole number. A good example is let's say I've got 12 pennies. Well, that's going to be 12.0000000 ad infinitum. If I say I've got three of something, if I have exactly three, that's an integer number. So whenever I have an integer like that, it does have infinite number of sig figs. And that's actually fairly useful. Um, in general, these numbers won't play, uh, these whole numbers won't play a big role when determining sig figs in a calculation. And that's actually fairly useful. Um, also, when completing a uh, calculation, you should also wait till the very end to determine the number of sig figs and then truncate the answer based on the number of sig figs you've been carrying. So in general, this means that while performing a calculation, I like to always underline how many sig figs so I don't lose track, but wait to round until the very end. Otherwise, you can essentially artificially change your number. Um, However, most of the time, this will only ever change that last digit, which, is should, which should be noted is estimated anyways. So try and carry as many significant figures around as possible. And you may find through the semester that, you're not, uh, that your answers may deviate slightly from mine. And that's because I calculate most of my, uh, my problems using Excel, which carries infinite number of uh, digits throughout the entire course of the operation. If you use a calculator, you're often gonna drop some, uh, some numbers along the way. And so your answer may deviate very slightly from mine. Um, finally, this gives us, gets the big point of when I'm actually at that point, how do I round off the final number? Most of you are familiar with how to do rounding. So what you're going to need to do is find your last significant digit and you're going to want to round. So in order to do this, you have to look at the first insignificant digit. The first insignificant digit is four or less, we tend to round down. If it's five or more, we tend to round up. So if it's six, four, six, two, six, three, it just becomes six. If it's six, five, six, seven, six, eight, we tend to go to seven. There are some special rules uh, if you end in exactly five, but for now, we're going to try and keep it simple and work from there. So uh, that brings us to the end of uh, this lecture. And next time, we're going to be playing around a little bit more with mathematical operations. Until then, take care.